Hi again, everybody. Boyd here with you, and welcome back. Well, this is part three of our 72-inch Starship Enterprise build series. I apologize for the delay between the last update. I've uh, been really busy with a lot of other stuff in the shop. I've got some stuff for the uh, big model sent out being worked on, the internal armature, and a couple other things. But I've been uh, working my way through the model a little bit here and there. Uh, one of the things that I was working on or wanted to think about working on in the very beginning was getting a stand for the model and getting it, you know, figured out how it's going to be mounted and all that. So I've been working on that here a little bit, and I'm going to get you guys updated on that. And we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, I just wanted to say a quick shout out to everybody out there. Um, hope you guys are all safe and sound, you and your family. A lot of crazy stuff going on in the country and in the world right now. So uh, stay safe out there. Uh, we've been uh, on lockdown here in San Antonio for the last week, and uh, we're just kind of staying at home and uh, doing our thing. We got our supplies and. Uh, so far, so good. Nobody we know has uh, been sick or anything like that, but uh, hopefully, knock on wood, everybody will be okay. Uh, so just wanted to say that to everybody. Hope you guys are finding something to do. Hopefully, you're getting a little bit of modeling time in while you're at home. That'd be the, that'd be the best thing, and I've uh, been doing a little bit of that here myself. Um, just another quick announcement before we get going. I've been thinking about this for a little while, but uh, we had quite a few requests come in uh, asking about uh, bringing back the old live show that we used to do here on the channel, the the model shop show and I've been thinking about that for a while uh, just wanted to answer a couple questions that came in about that about the reason why it stopped and everything and just real quick tell you that uh, uh, I still really enjoyed doing the show live it was a lot of fun I really enjoyed the uh, the especially the chat part where we interacted with all the other modelers out there and had a lot of fun doing that answering questions and things and uh, but it came down to where it was just taking a lot of time to prepare for it every week uh, I would sit down and write a script and try to you know buy a couple model kits for reviews and you know always have something kind of interesting and kind of a structured show and uh, it started taking you know a couple of hours every week to put all that together and I just was really busy with my other work that I have here in the shop and it started cutting into the you know the, the time started conflicting and uh, rather than keeping the show going and cutting back on the amount of effort I was putting into it I uh, just decided it'd be a good idea to shut it down I, you know I showed a lot of uh, we covered a lot of ground on the show. We uh, showed a lot of the modeling tips I use here, everything from painting to electronics to, you know, everything in between. And um, so we covered a lot of ground. But uh, long story short, I've been thinking about it for a while. A lot of people are still uh, apparently interested in it. So I'm going to bring back a live show. It's going to be called uh, uh, Trekworks Live at the Bench. And uh, it's going to be a little bit different format than the original Model Shop show. It's not going to be uh, like a structured show per se. I'm just going to kind of hop on at a certain time of the week, uh, at a certain time, you know, maybe I haven't figured out the day yet, but uh, maybe Tuesday nights, maybe Thursday nights, maybe Saturday nights. We'll kind of put it out there and see what people think. But uh, around seven o'clock U.S. Central Time, and it would just kind of run uh, its course. You know, it might be only an hour. It might go two hours because I'm just going to sit down and uh, show you guys what I'm working on, whatever I happen to be working on at the moment, what's going on on my bench. I'm either doing some client work or I'm working on some of my own stuff. A lot of my own stuff, uh, some of you guys asked about that too, that really slowed down because uh, I really ran out of room in my model display room. I, I literally, even to put like a 124 scale car, I had no place to put it. So I went in there and kind of took a look at that whole thing and, you know, kind of rearranged some stuff and made it a lot more efficient. I put up some more shelves. I think I'm good for maybe about another year's worth of building and then I'll be kind of back in the same boat again, but we'll just have to cross that bridge when we get to it, I guess. But uh, anyways, I can I, I can do a lot more building now. So um, I've got some, you know, plenty of models here in the shop to work on. We've got a lot of cool different things. I may work on some model kits. I may even do a prop or something like that over in the corner over there. I've got a, a really cool one-to-one -one scale uh, Star Trek, the original series phaser rifle, which you only saw like in maybe one or two episodes. And uh, I bought that kit. It's a fiberglass kit. I wanted, you know, put it together and put, you know, light effects and sound effects in it and everything. So you might see something like that uh, come up on the bench at some point. But it'll be mostly model building, but, you know, all genres, sci-fi, cars, uh, everything in between. So I hope you guys will uh, uh, check that out. And uh, I'll just kind of put it out there and see what kind of interest. If, it's, uh, if it turns out to be, you know, uh, people like it, then we might go to uh, more than one night a week. We'll just kind of see how it goes, but again, it's not going to be like a really structured thing uh, or anything like that. Just, you know, get on there. I'll have the chat running so I can intermingle with people that come in, maybe answer some questions, find out what's going on out there with everybody else, and and uh, just have some fun. So I uh, hope you guys will check it out. I'll make an announcement pretty soon about when they're going to start. Um, probably a week or two, i got to order a couple things in. I need a couple additional uh, cameras i got to set up, and i got to put in a USB hub, but I checked out the... Uh, 
uh, my streaming stuff and everything, and it's, it still seems to be working fine, so it should work pretty good. Hope you guys will tune in, and uh, looking forward to seeing a lot of the old crowd there. We used to have a lot of fun doing that. But uh, back to what's on hand for today. We're going to be getting to the Starship Enterprise, the big 72-incher. Uh, I want to share with you guys um, a... Uh, a really crude drawing that I have here. I apologize for my drawing. I'm not the best artist in the world, but I think I can get my point across. Uh, back when I uh, started, you know, got the model and started thinking about how to put it together and everything, I was one of the ideas I was thinking about right away was what kind of a stand to display it on. And, um, you know, with the idea of uh, the model may go to a couple model shows and things like that, so it may have to be on some kind of a stage or on some kind of a floor. So I was thinking about how high I would want to have the model standing. Uh, if it was on the ground, you know, something like that. So I, I made some careful measurements using a tape measure, uh, taking into account that, uh, you know, the average person is around between five and six feet tall. So I came up with a, you know, a measurement of just a little bit, you know, almost exactly five feet tall to the very top of the saucer so that most people will be able to still see the detail on the top of the saucer when they walk up to it. And of course, be able to see everything else. Uh, and then, um, you know, that'll be pretty, pretty much the overall height. Now, this little... Uh, of course, this is the Enterprise mounted on this stand here at the top. And this item here in the middle is kind of the interactive display base, is what I'm calling it, with a tripod mounted underneath of it. This unit here will be kind of the main uh, interface with the model. It's going to be completely remote controlled. Uh, it's going to have a 12-inch vertical LCD screen here in the center of it that's going to play some interactive uh, video clips and things like that, some action shots of the of the original ship from the TV show you know, orbiting planets, flybys, uh, action shots, stuff like that. Just kind of in a looping sequence. It'll be kind of neat when it's on display with sound effects along with it. In each of these uh, uh, areas right here, there'll be a five-inch speaker on each side, so it'll have a really nice, loud, and clear uh, high-definition sound system in it that'll tie in with whatever kind of um, sound effects I actually build into the model. I'll probably do a couple of things like the... Uh, firing phasers, photons, you know, red alert, warp engine sounds, things like that that I've done before with some of my soundboards. And we'll have that all incorporated into this. Well, the neat thing about this whole thing is, is that it will be sort of a dual purpose display. So when it's on a stage or something like that, it'll sit on this tripod and uh, the base will be secured to that. And then, of course, the Enterprise will be up here on top. This little tube you see coming up here will be a nice metal rod, uh, steel tubing. And that'll uh, go up inside the model, and it'll so the model will be able to swivel 360 degrees, and it'll be really stable and, and secure. You know, the model is actually really light for the size, and uh, this will be heavily reinforced and everything. Now, inside of the tube, there'll be a little jack, just a standard uh, you know plus and minus connector jack, like the old um, guitar amplifier jacks that we used to see, those kind of big heavy duty ones, and that'll provide power to the model. All the internal wiring will be remaining inside the model, and the control board that operates the uh, blinking navigational lights will be mounted inside the model on a little shelf right up here towards the front, uh, you know, mounted to the armature. This forward kind of deflector housing area will be removable, held on with some magnets. You'll be able to pop that off, and on a little shelf in here, the board will be able to uh, slide out. I'll have a little bit of uh, extra, you know, slack in the wiring there, and a quick connector on the um, board itself coming from Tenet Controls. And uh, so if you ever have a problem with the board, the board will be a quick swap out. I'm going to have a little cubbyhole compartment here uh, down in the uh, base area that's going to have actually a spare control board sitting in there in case you'd ever need it. Kind of high, highly unlikely. Uh, the tenant control boards are really reliable and uh, they'll run for years and years. So, but, you know, just in case. And then, of course, the uh, spinning bassards up here for the warp engine effect uh, will have their own separate control boards and motors up in here in this whole area will be removable as well for service if it ever needs to be done. Now, the modular part of this model is that it'll be, it will be able to be broken down when, when you want to you know, store it or take it for a trip or something like that. The nacelles are going to be detachable at the upper pylon here as well as the saucer. I'm going to use the same method, have a, you know, a power jack in here uh, and a power jack in here so that when you, when you lock these into place, you know, power is supplied, you don't have a a wire hanging out with a connector that you're going to be taking you know, apart all the time and you know, wearing it out. Those jacks last a long, long time. You won't be taking it apart that often anyway, but that's the whole kind of concept of this. So uh, when you're not displaying it on the uh, stage, you'll be able to detach this whole system here and sit this on top of either a table or a shelf. And this thing is self-contained, so it'll still work exactly the same. I'm going to have a 110 power cord coming out of this thing that can be plugged into a 
extension cord or a wall. Internally, it'll have a uh, you know a power supply that'll drop the uh, 110 down to either 9 volts or 12 volt DC. I haven't decided what I'm going to run the model at yet, but that'll be inverted on the inside, and that will also power up the sound system and everything else, the little LCD screen and everything here. So uh, when I get to building the cabinet, I'm going to share that whole thing with you guys it's like I said it's a really crude drawing the plan is it's gonna be you know in the fit on the face plate here it'll be slightly slanted uh, sloped you know back so it won't have a uh, a glare on it or whatever when you look at it and you'll be able to kind of when you're standing in front of the screen will be easily seen and uh, should be pretty cool but uh, just to kind of wrap this whole thing up you know I had talked to a couple of friends of mine here in town about uh, fabricating this lower part here because I you know I really didn't know if there was something exactly what I was thinking of available and so I had kind of thought of the idea that we're going to probably have to build that. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I was walking through Home Depot, of all places, and uh, they sold these um, these quartz work lights. You know, they, people have probably seen it. It's They're sitting on a stand. There's two big rectangular quartz lights. They're like floodlights. They're known for putting out a lot of heat. They're used at work sites and stuff like that or in car, you know, automotive garages and stuff. And uh, they had a set there, and it was, uh, you know, I think it was around 40 bucks or 50 bucks for the whole thing. And so I bought it and brought it home, and I'm going to show you the base here in just a second. But the base turned out to be, uh, you know, ideal for what I'm looking for. I mean, it's a perfect, uh, uh, it's adjustable, the height on it. It's very wide, it's stable, it's very heavy-duty built. The only problem that I have with it is it painted it sort of a uh, bright yellow, which is for safety reasons. So I'll be repainting this to a dark matte, you know, like a dark matte color, probably black in a flat color. So if anybody wants to... Um, photograph the model later on or something you know they'll have a they can put it in front of a background and then uh, it'll be easier to blend all that in you know using photoshop or whatever so uh, that's kind of the plan for that but uh, we're also going to be uh, uh, so I'll take you over and show you the um, the uh, base in, in just a second here but uh, tonight we're also gonna uh, do a little bit of painting and uh, I'm gonna be using acrylic paints on the model uh, recently some acrylic paints came out that are um, uh, available one is a uh, heather gray which is uh, looking at the research over at the um, uh, Smithsonian website where they documented everything that was done on the restoration of the original 11 foot uh, filming model from the original Star Trek series uh, they did a lot of uh, research when they disassembled the model they figured out what all the original colors was by scanning it um, doing about uh, things and they listed a bunch of these uh, colors for all of us modelers out there and what the most popular or most likely um, modern paints are that match up with these original colors. Now, Heather Gray happens to be one of the colors that they mentioned for the basic hull color. Now, uh, so I went out and got some Heather Gray, and we're going to show you that here on the bench in just a second. Uh, I actually sprayed up a little uh, piece of cardboard with some basic Heather Gray. And then, uh, according to the uh, research they did, the Heather Gray kind of closely resembles the original hull color. In other words, the first time the model was done, uh, it was more of a neutral, kind of a concrete color, uh, you know, kind of a really super light gray. Uh, it had no weathering on it. It was uh, no lighting. They actually hung the model from the ceiling when they when they did the shots for the original uh, first pilot episode of Star Trek called The Cage. Uh, you'll notice in that episode, if you go back and look at it, the only thing that's lit is the... Uh, the top of the dome of the of the bridge when they when they zoom in on it and that was a camera trick you know they overlaid a a scene of the uh, crew running around inside the bridge when they zoom in on it but the rest of the ship is completely uh, you know no lights at all they just had little pieces of black vinyl tape on the sides of the hull and the saucer to kind of simulate windows or whatever so at some point you know later on they start upgrading it uh, they changed the color it it changed more to a uh, uh, a gray but it had a little bit of a greenish just a very slight greenish tint to it and then of course some weathering was added the grid lines were added on the saucer and things like that so uh, they were literally working and changing the model all the way up until the very end of production when the show was canceled they were still doing little things to it here and there uh, just by the way if you guys are interested there's a really spectacular uh, either DVD or Blu-ray set out there called the Roddenberry vaults like Gene Roddenberry I picked that up a couple years ago. Uh, most of it is uh, kind of rehashed stuff of, um, you know, the making of Star Trek. That you, If you're into Star Trek and you've got the original uh, DVDs or the Blu-ray set, you've probably seen all the behind-the-scenes stuff that they put out on that. But there's a whole about 20-minute se uh, sequence in this that uh, is of the original 11-foot model of the Enterprise on the stage. And they're, you know, setting up test shots and everything, doing flybys. And, uh, and it's done in regular room lighting, so there's no filtering or anything like that. 
and the film quality is superb. It's like that film is uh, mint original condition and it's in high definition. You know, they use some good quality film stock and uh, it's really cool to watch because you can see all these weird changes that were going on with the ship, you know, from the very beginning to where it wound up as a full production version where some of the blinking lights were in different places. Uh, some of the lights that blinked uh, were taken out and some that didn't blink before were added. Um, even the little dome on the back by the shuttle on the top was blinking at one point. They tried some tin foil inside of the uh, 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 Bassard domes that spun that kind of looked like the old Jiffy Pop popcorn things. It's really strange to see all that and uh, you can see that they kind of you know, evolved it all the way through. So I used a lot of that for reference as far as the colors and everything. And uh, so I came up with my hull color, which is the basic um, heather gray with a little bit of uh, what we call jade green tinted into it. Not very much, just enough to take it off of that kind of neutral gray look and add just the slightest hint of green. And I'm going to show you how to mix that up. And I'm going to also show you today how I uh, actually use that paint. I've, I've been working with this water-based acrylic now and uh, come up with a couple of techniques that I think work pretty good for uh, you know using it and spraying it, mixing it and all that. Just using regular tap water, it works just fine. You can use, um, you know, like Windex or something that has a little bit of alcohol in it too. If you want it to dry a little bit faster and thin it a little bit better, that works pretty good. But it's really important how much you thin it and everything because uh, if you thin it too much, it's very thin. It can run really easily. It's very transparent. You'll have to put several coats and you kind of have to set your, you know, your gun, whether it's your... Um, your airbrush or if your mini spray gun that you're going to use to spray this stuff you have to kind of set it up a little bit and make it work um, so what we're going to be doing today I'm going to be uh, painting the very first part of the uh, of the big ship here today I've been doing mostly prep work on this on all the other stuff you know uh, cutting open windows which I'm still doing that's a really slow process because the model is uh, uh, made mostly out of carbon fiber and it's really tough and it's really slow going you can't you know it's totally a different process than if you've ever tried it on uh, using files and everything, tried it on um, resin or plastic, this stuff is much tougher and uh, you have to take your time. It's actually worn out a couple of my files already. That carbon fiber is that good. So, uh, But this is one of the first things that we're going to be starting to paint. You can see I've all already got the, um, the copper color done here kind of in the center. Uh, I'm going to actually dull coat this later on. It's a little bit too shiny. Uh, I just put a nice gloss coat to seal it all up. But this is all... Uh, water-based uh, acrylic paint that I used on this too but we're gonna paint this external part of the housing here in the hull color today and that's the uh, first thing that I'm gonna show you getting done so uh, we'll knock that out here on the bench in just a little bit so what I'll do is uh, pause really quick go over to a different camera and I'm gonna show you the uh, the stand that I'm gonna be working with for the model first and explain that a little bit better and uh, show you the you know the hull up on it and kind of give you an idea of the size and the scale and all that and then uh, We'll move along from there and come back with uh, doing a little bit of paint work, working with the acrylic water-based paints and all that, and we'll see you for that in just a second, everybody. Be right back. All right, you guys. Well, here's a look at the uh, the stand itself. As you can see, it's a horrible safety yellow color, but other than that, everything on this thing is going to work out really good for what I'm uh, thinking of doing here. You can see it's got an adjustable sleeve there towards the bottom, uh, so you can raise and lower the height, but that at the... Uh, just about fully extended level. It's just about perfect. Uh, it's got a really wide stance made out of really heavy duty metal. It should be really uh, stable sitting on a floor or whatever. And again, the model, as I mentioned at the beginning of this whole thing, is extremely light for the size. It's probably going to be less than 20 pounds or so when it's all finished up, which is amazing for something that's, uh, you know, six feet long. So um, it's going to work out great. Now I'm going to tilt the camera up here a little bit and uh, hopefully I can slide past my camera without knocking it over here and I'll walk over here and show you just kind of a scale this is me standing behind it uh, this is the uh, the hull of the model and you can see it's going to sit kind of something like this uh, up on top and so at this level right here it's going to be perfect because looking at what the top of the saucer is going to be right in here um, me being about a little over six feet tall I'm about six feet one I'll be able to see on top of the saucer and see all the detail and people right around my height are a little bit shorter, you know, five foot and a half or whatever, you'll be able to see up there just fine. And again, the model will be able to swivel 100% all the way around on this uh, on this base that we have here. So that's going to work out really, really good. And of course, you know, it's just going to be able to drop down on top of this. So if we ever want to take it off, we just lift it straight up. Uh, we can take the uh, nacelles off. We're going to be able to take the saucer off. 
And so that's going to be, you know, really a nice little display. I shouldn't say little, but, you know, it's going to work out and be all modular and everything. You can see the level that the uh, control box will be at right here, which will be just about perfect for standing on a stage. Or if later on, if it's sitting on a, a desktop, you'll be able to look down on it really nice and see all that interactive uh, video screen and hear the sound nice and clear and everything. So, anyways, guys, that's the idea for that. Uh, what I'm going to be doing here is just taking some... Uh, you know, some steel wool and scuffing this all down and just uh, doing a, a nice uh, matte black uh, paint job on this. And then you can see, but it's got these adjustable, you know, these removable uh, things here for where the original lights were mounted on this. So that's going to be really nice, these kind of thumb, thumb screws here for holding this whole thing together when I want to take it apart. We'll just lift the lid on the, uh, on the, the little box right here and we'll just be able to take these out and pop it right off. It'll be on there nice and secure. I'll have to modify things here a little to bring all the, you know, the power up through the middle. Uh, as I said, the box itself will have its own 110 power coming to it, and uh, it'll all just kind of come along when we when we want to, you know, take them apart and put them back together. So, there you have it, guys. There's the stand. Uh, not a whole lot of exciting stuff right now, but it's all stuff that has to be done. And I just wanted to share, you know, my, my plan on this is to share every little thing that we do on this with you. You haven't missed anything. Uh, just uh, doing some filing of windows is all you've really missed. Um, so I'll come back in just a second. We'll get over to the uh, other bench and we're going to start painting the uh, deflector housing and I'll show you how to mix up that paint and uh, hopefully that'll be uh, helpful to all you guys out there to have asked me about that. So we'll be right back everybody. Okay everybody, here we are over in the uh, painting area and I'm getting ready to make up my uh, hull color that I talked about a little while ago. These are the uh, acrylic colors that I'm using. These are folk art and Anita's water-based acrylics. Um, this uh, one here is what they call Heather Gray and this one's called Faded Jade. Uh, the, the basic color here of the hull uh, when you spray the uh, Heather Gray looks like this. I did this little card here to show you guys just kind of in raw form what it looks like and uh, the camera is tinting it a little bit weird too because I'm in a bright light area here. Um, it looks like a really light concrete color, you know, like a concrete gray. And that's not quite right for the way uh, the ship looks now that it's been restored and the way uh, it appears at the Smithsonian. And that's what I'm kind of trying to replicate. So adding a little bit of the uh, faded jade here, you can see that uh, it changes it more to a uh, grayish green color. You know, it's a gray, but it's it's a kind of a more of a warm looking gray and it's got just a little bit of green again the green is looking more bold here on this camera with this just like you can see the skin on my on my arms looks like I'm sunburned or something I'm not really sunburned um, so it's kind of you know bringing that up a little bit more but in person it looks just right and I matched it up with the color chip that I um, downloaded from the uh, Trek core website where they have the you know the hull color uh, uh, picture there so I'm really pleased with the color. So what I'm going to be doing right now is actually showing you how I mix it. It's really straightforward. There's only two colors involved here. Now what I've done is I've made a big batch, a master batch of this color. Um, that's the color that I'll be using for... Uh, I'm working on a 350 scale Enterprise right now. And uh, I want to make sure when I spray that model, uh, I'm spraying all from the same batch. I'm not going to make a small little cup and then run out and then have to mix more. Um, even though it's, you know, I can get it by eye, I can get it really close if I would happen to have to do that. Because And there's only two colors involved here. If you start making a, a custom color that has, um, you know, five or six different shades in it, unless you're using, a, you know, a, a scale and doing it by the exact amount of grams or whatever, um, which is the way they mix custom paints, um, you'll have a hard time matching that again. But with just two basic colors here, it's not that hard to do. So, uh, real simple, I'm going to start off here with... Um, uh, putting mainly my uh, my base color in here, which is this uh, heather gray, and this stuff's kind of creamy. You know, it's like a it's like a thick, almost like a maple syrup uh, thickness of this stuff when you get it out of the bottle raw. And a lot of you guys have already been working with this stuff, but just kind of breaking it down for people who are new to using it. And uh, so we have that, and I'm going to start mixing in a little bit of my uh, uh, jade green. And we've got our little handy-dandy um, badger mixing tool here, so I'm just going to get down in there and start stirring this good stuff up here. 
and uh, just keep watching with my eye to where I can start seeing it um, you know going from that base neutral color of that kind of you know slate looking gray to more of this kind of greenish looking gray you can see it with your eye now keep in mind um, this paint and I've noticed it with just about all their shades um, the stuff what it does is it uh, it darkens maybe like one and a half shades uh, from what it looks like right now when it's dry so I do that with that you know with that thought in mind when I mix up these colors and um, again you know I can explain this as much as possible here uh, that I can do it but you're just gonna have to play around with it a little bit yourself and make a little adjustments the beauty of this is that this paints not really that expensive so you can afford to experiment a little bit I'm gonna put a little bit more green now and I'm gonna also just start adding in a little bit of water. This is just regular tap water in a little squirt bottle. So I can start thinning it down. It'll stir a little bit better that way too. Just get it going here. Okay, it's getting closer. I think we're going to go one more shot of green here. We don't want it to be a mint green. We just want it to be gray with a slight... Uh, it's, it's a strange looking green. When you look at the pictures of the model online, if you go to Trek Core or the Smithsonian website and look at the... They have some beautiful uh, high definition pictures of the, uh, the restored ship. And you'll see that... Uh, you know, depending on what kind of light's hitting it, whether it's whether it's uh, you know bright light on the top of a flat surface or a curved area, it looks kind of a you know like a like a really light gray. But then areas, if you look at it again, you'll see areas where it's a little bit you know dark, or there's a shadow on it or whatever. It has a slight, uh, definite slight green tint to it. So okay, so I'm pretty happy with. Uh, where we're at right here, it looks a little bit light in the in the cup. I'm going to show it to you. Um, looks a little bit light in the cup, but again, like I said, this stuff gets darker when it dries. So we're going to stop right there. Uh, I'm going to um, use my uh, card here. Now, what what I did with this card is I I painted it and then I uh, you know both, both sides with the base and then I I sprayed over the whole thing with a little bit of clear. So I can just kind of take uh, my finger here and dab a little bit of that on there, kind of like so. And I'm going to take my hair dryer really quick and I'm just going to dry it. Now, besides it being dull, the, you know, the, this is a semi-gloss clear that I put on here. This dries totally flat in base form, but holding it up to the camera here, I'm pretty sure you can't even see it. Uh, it's blended in just right. I got the color right where I wanted it to be. Uh, and, and this, again, uh, will darken up just, just the ever slightest amount when you put a coat of clear over it, too. Um, so, you know, again, you want to... Uh, I always keep these little pieces of cardboard. This is actually a... A backer that came in some package I had or something. I keep this stuff. It's that fine kind of white flat cardboard and I use that for exactly this uh, same thing. I do all my test spraying on stuff like this. Uh, you can also you know do it on like a plastic spoon. Um, and that way if you're thinking about something you haven't tried before, a combination of paints or whatever uh, and clear coats and things like that, you can apply the whole uh, process you know from your base coat to your clear and if you're gonna have a problem of some kind it's gonna show up on this piece of cardboard and it's just a small little area you didn't waste a lot of paint you didn't waste a lot of clear and uh, you didn't script your model that's the main thing so um, a lot of people it's, it's kind of funny I've had a lot of new uh, new beginner people that uh, ask me questions about you know paint issues on the model and uh, uh, that's one of the things that you really want to do is you want to use something to test spray first it's really important uh, and once you get a system down with certain types of paints you use, clear coats that work with them, primers that work with them, I recommend um, sticking with that, you know. Um, 
right in the middle of a new project changing to a different primer or a different clear or something uh, there's been a lot of uh, nightmare stories about things that have happened when you do things like that and again if you are going to switch to something new go through a little test process like this so we have the color now uh, that we're going to use so I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more water to it and what I'm looking for for, for viscosity of this or thickness of it is uh, maybe just a tiny little bit more thick than than regular uh, milk not you know not runny like water but um, you know not not uh, super thick either where it won't spray now one of the things I'm going to point out about spraying this is that uh, in order to get good coverage with it and in order for it to you know along with that coverage not having to apply a lot of it in a heavy coat to get it to cover anything um, you want to have it a little bit thick. If you have it too thin, uh, it's going to run and it's going to be really transparent. That's the only uh, drawback with uh, these new water-based paints is that uh, they do they do tend to not cover as well, and um, you have to put you know a couple more coats. They they need to be sprayed a little bit thinner than the old stuff because the actual solvent in like lacquer or uh, you know the old acrylic enamels, the thinner actually helped. Uh, as a flow agent and it helps move the material inside the uh, uh, the airbrush or the air gun or whatever and it's sort of a self-cleaning agent too. It, it, it kind of helps from getting clogged. Um, but this is stuff, you know, you have to spray this a little bit thicker. So as a result of that, if you're going to use it in an airbrush, um, there are a couple of things I want to point out. I have two different airbrushes here. I have an Iwata Eclipse HP, which is sort of a uh, an, a fine artist type brush. It's a it's a you know dual action airbrush, uh, and it's made for um, detail painting. In other words, doing shading, uh, you know, fine type painting. And it you know of course with that uh, being said, it has a really small needle in it. Uh, I don't know exactly what the needle that comes. It's, the needle that's in mine is the one it came from the factory with, but uh, it's a smaller needle than a normal airbrush. Uh, and now I also have an Awada Neo which is a dual action brush as well and that's this one right here that I've currently got loaded up um, it's um, it's more of a general purpose airbrush it's got a bigger needle in it and it's made for you know not so much fine detail painting it's just made for painting surfaces you know like painting the body on your uh, scale model car or you know something like that just just basically covering something with paint and so with that type of an airbrush the uh, this this uh, paint works better um, it doesn't work so great in the uh, Eclipse or some of the, the you know the smaller detail brushes unless you really really thin it down um, if you're gonna you know in other words you can't use a brush like that and use this paint for general cover you'd be you'll be there all day you'll be it's like trying to mow a football field with a push mower and um, you know it, it'll be a it'll be a big time consumer and you'll get uneven streakiness and all kinds um, so you want a brush that puts out a little bit more volume and that's something like the Neo or you know some of the other posh basic basic posh brushes that are out there uh, Badger makes some that are for general and for you know uh, you know detail they, they all have their different purposes so just kind of keep that in mind but um, we're painting a big model this time this is you know going to be a six foot long model all the parts on this except for some of the small little detail parts are, are huge and uh, painting that with an airbrush is not going to make a whole lot of sense so what I'm using is you guys have seen me use this quite a bit but I'm using this um, little uh, detail mini gun here which is a basically an airbrush on steroids it's kind of in between a you know a regular uh, uh, paint gun you'd use to paint a car and an airbrush so it's it's great for stuff like this and uh, you can buy these really cheap uh, I buy these at uh, Harbor Freight um, and you know I go through them I don't know, maybe one will last me, um, you know, a year or something like that. And they're around 25 or 30 bucks. They come with a regulator, so they're all set up. Uh, and they'll spray any kind of material. You can use solvent-based or water-based or whatever you want. And uh, they work great. So um, the inside is a lot cleaner than the outside. I'm a, I'm a typical uh, uh, production painter in my career. Um, you know, we don't, we're not really known for keeping the outside of the guns clean. Um, so much because we're using them all all the time and uh, but the inside's got to be clean this is spotlessly clean and it's ready to go so we're going to go ahead and load our paint up into this uh, now a next important step for this paint uh, in particular is that uh, it's even brand new bottles I've noticed that it's um, uh, it's chunky uh, no matter how much you stir it no matter how much you let it sit 
whatever, it, it, it'll just wind up being little chunks in it, so you got to strain it. And that's something that I do with uh, pretty much all my paint anyway. I don't trust even br uh, brand new paint. Uh, when you're painting as a professional, like I did for a lot of years, the last thing that you want to have happen is uh, chunks of stuff coming through your gun or clogging it up in the middle of a job that's otherwise going perfect, you know. So that's a really good way to bring a downer to the whole thing. So I always strain my paint, and uh, you just get these little strainers. You can buy these at Home Depot or your local paint supply store. I buy a whole sleeve of these things for like, you know, five bucks, and there's like 200 of them in there. And so I don't mind using them. But we've got this, I want to check my consistency one more time here. I think it's a little bit too thick still. I'm going to add a little bit more water. And then I'm just going to stir it this time with a, with a stick. We don't need to hit it again with the uh, mighty power tool here. So, getting this down to where it's got a nice consistency. You know, it's it's um, still might be a little bit too thick. I put more paint in than what I thought, but that's all right. You got to, again, guys, I can tell you, I can try and explain this all day long. Um, but uh, you, with the consistency of the stuff, you're just going to have to get it thin enough where it'll spray through your gun or your brush and it won't uh, clog but yet not be too thin where you're going to get all kinds of runs and you can't cover anything with it and of course lighter colors like this are going to be harder to cover with dark colors cover better we kind of all know that but um, I'm just going to go ahead and pour, pour the whole thing in here and this paint for some reason it gets uh, when you stir it with the electric tool there it will it can get a little bit foamy and I'll just kind of wait and you know let that settle down before I start spraying. Maybe a minute or two and it's it's ready to go. So we'll get this out of the way. Get that out of the way. Get my hand cleaned up here. I'm making a lot more mess than I usually do. Um, so we're ready to go here. Um, got the gun all loaded up. I'm spraying at about uh, 30 PSI. I'm just going to give it a quick test spray here. Looks like it's working real good. So I'm spraying about 30 PSI. Uh, I've got all my standard settings. Now on these particular guns you can uh, adjust the volume down here, how much uh, paint you're bringing in. You can adjust when the paint comes in on the trigger. So by moving the needle forward uh, you're going to bring paint in sooner. So that means that it's more trigger, you know, more of a hair trigger, which I kind of like. I like to bring the paint in right away. And then the, this one here of course is your fan. So that's how narrow you want the um, spray to be the ideal thing when you hold it up to a flat surface and spray it you should get with you know about that far away you should get sort of an elongated oval shape if it's set right you just have to play with that too if you haven't used one of these guns before but don't let it scare you it's not that hard guys so okay we've got our gun set up we've got everything ready to go i'm going to go ahead and uh get everything out of the way here and we're going to bring in our part we've got the uh, deflector housing all masked up and ready to go here and uh, we'll get the gun over to this side and bring the part in. Now I've primed this um, with just regular Duplicolor primer and I've sanded it once with 600 just to kind of smooth out the primer and you can see I've masked off the entire uh, let me get the camera up just a little bit higher here I've masked off the entire copper area. We want to, we want our hull color to be down inside here, which is going to be a little bit difficult because this is a you know narrow gap. I'll just have to just lightly dust the paint in there and not try to you know blow a bunch in there and get runs or whatever. But then we're just going to spray around the entire outer surface here and get our hull color on there. So uh, as I do this, I'm just going to uh, use a little bit of force drying with my uh, heat gun here. Now. I'll talk about that again real quick too. I use a heat gun here and I've been using one for years. I'm really used to it. It has a low and a high setting, but uh, these can be overkill for most people. The reason I always used a heat gun is because I was doing huge parts. I was painting an entire uh, bumper on a car, you know, like a plastic bumper or a part of a door or whatever, and I would heat it, you know, heat it because uh, a lot of times you're painting in cold weather and stuff, uh, and I'd force dry it so it would dry right away, and that's less chance you have of. Uh, debris getting stuck to it, you know, the, what, the longer it's wet, the more crap's going to get in it, basically. So, um, we want to try to avoid that, but I use that same technique here, but you can use a, a hair dryer, which is perfectly fine. Um, it'll work exactly the same. In fact, a hair dryer might work a little bit better because it blows a little bit more volume of air. It doesn't get quite as hot, but it, it'll move a lot more air than this will. 
Uh, so that might work great for you, but it's something I do. So the last thing we're going to do before I spray is uh, I've got a tack cloth here. Um, for people who have not uh, familiarized their thrills with these, you can buy these at your local auto parts store. It's basically a cheese cloth. It's a piece of cloth that has a sort of semi-sticky surface on it, although not too sticky. Uh, if you if you buy the good quality stuff like uh, 3M or whatever, DuPont, they'll have um, not too much of the wax in it so it won't leave you know crud on your surface. It'll just wipe off nice and clean. You don't want to scrub this on whatever you're wiping down either. You just drag it over it to get the loose dust and stuff off. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm just going to go over it and get all the loose... Um, you know, there might be any dust on it that's settled here in the last uh, hour after I, you know, since I primed it. And then uh, that just kind of, you know, gets rid of it. And it sticks to this. But again, I'm, you can see I'm not like, dra you know, I'm not scrubbing it on there because... Um, you could get some of this stuff stuck on there if you do that. It's just, you know, it's kind of a, that's why the wax is on there. It just kind of grabs the stuff and pulls it off. So we should be clean there. Got the heat gun ready. Got the um, uh, gun ready to go here. Again, spraying at 30 PSI. I'm going to turn on my ventilation and start spraying. We'll spray this whole thing down. We're going to be doing it in stages. I'll do a light coat, stop, dry it, and then continue on. So if you can't hear me too well, this is what we're doing. Here we go. Make sure my fan is out nice and wide. There we go. Try to keep a nice, even uh, trigger pressure so you don't... Uh, splatter you know if your needle and everything is adjusted really good in your gun you shouldn't get many splatters when you go off and on the trigger but uh, just keep working our way around here I'm just barely missing it on there that's the that's the trick with this stuff, so you don't get any runs. I'm really happy with how that color is looking already. This is really robust, thick resin, this part that I'm working on right now. So I'm not, you know, getting worried about melting it with the heat gun. Um, if it was a plastic piece or whatever, I'd be a little bit more careful. Try to stay back about six or seven inches at least from the from the paint when you're uh, using a heat gun. If you using a dryer, you don't have a uh, hair dryer, you don't have to worry about it as much. Okay, we want to start getting around the top here a little bit, trying to get it down inside there. Sorry about the compressor noise, guys. Um, now you can see, I don't know if you guys can literally see it on camera here, but you can see it darken right up when I uh, when I dry it. I would say it's about a shade to a shade and a half. It goes darker than uh, than what it was in, in the cup. So you just have to experiment. Once you get it locked down, that's when you make your big batch. If you're going to paint an entire model, you know, or if you just need a little bit, like one couple do it, then that's fine. Like I was saying, this um, I have the master batch stored in this little Tupperware container. These work great, especially for these water-based paints. You know, uh, it won't attack the plastic or anything, and it's perfectly airtight. I've had a batch of paint sit in one of those for um, that I had mixed up for probably two months, and. Uh, needed to use it again and I just barely had to put a little bit of water in it to wake it back up and it was ready to go so I really like that I uh, as you guys know I used uh, automotive paints for a long time and um, but these acrylics are really really nice and they dry amazingly smooth uh, and they dry fast especially for seating like this if I do get a little piece of dust or uh, a, you know, a hair or something like that in the paint. 
I just wait till it's completely dry and most of the time I can just walk, walk up with the uh, with the uh, cheesecloth and just lightly you know rub it and it'll just pull it right off I might have to do a quick you know one quick little kind of like this to fix it and uh, just smooth as can be and then ready for you know a sealer like a uh, most of the time you're going to want to use a sealer coat on top of this it'll help make it a little bit harder and, and uh, you know so you're going to use like you can use either keep it flat or you can use a medium or a high gloss clear on it automotive clear works perfectly fine I haven't found anything that this reacts with it just uh, it works really good it doesn't react with anything having any problem with any kind of primer but again, like I mentioned, I, I, I try to stay with the same kind of primer all the time. I just use the regular uh, two-in-one uh, stuff from uh, Duplicolor. Looking good here, guys. Getting nice coverage. No runs or anything yet. Again, I'm just trying to get a little bit force down in here. You really can't see in there um, that little gap, but I just want to get enough paint down in there where it, uh, you know, it looks nice and blended in. We're already just about done here, guys. That quick. And once I'm done force drying this, you can actually handle it. Of course, you want your hands to be nice and clean, but it's it's already dry completely. Just looking to make sure I have good coverage. I'm just going to go over these little nooks and crannies a little bit better. these smaller little detail parts like this I'm okay painting from a, a separate match like I said I matched it really close with my eye you'd never be able to tell the difference on the main parts when I do the saucer you know the secondary hull the nacelles all that stuff I'll be spraying it all from the from the exact same batch of paint just to make sure you know because if anything is a little bit off you'll notice on big areas like that where you know these little attachment parts you can't really tell Unless it's like way off, but we know we're, uh, we're looking good here. So as you can see, um, not sure how well it's showing for you on the camera or not. We'll stop here in a second. I'll hold it up a little closer. I think that's about it for the paint. One last go over here. And remember, um, this will darken up again just a tiny little bit when I put clear coat on it. Because uh, this is an extremely flat paint and it reflects a lot of light off of it when it's uh, flat like that. It doesn't let it bounce in. So a little bit of clear on that is going to let that look more deep and therefore a little bit darker. So, alright, that's pretty much it for the painting and the drying. I'll hold this up for you guys a little closer. Knock it off of here first. But um, I don't know if you can see it too well, but it's a nice light, light gray with a, just a slight amount of green in it. And it's maybe better if I show you in low light, maybe. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it, it's just right, guys. It looks absolutely perfect for the Enterprise. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go ahead and... Um, unmask this thing off camera here and I'm gonna dust it down with some of my sealer because I wanted to make the uh, the center part of the copper area more dull like I mentioned and then the deflector dish itself I want to use some dull coat on that we'll get that all finished up and I'll come back and show you the finished product here be right back okay everybody back with you after we're all said and done here and uh, this is how it came out just kind of uh, spin it around here for you 
I applied some dull coat onto the entire thing. I got the inner housing done here, and I got the the dish done, and I I sprayed the entire um, you know the housing down, and uh, it came out beautiful. I'm gonna see if I can pick it up here, and uh, just so you guys can see how clean it turned out. It's perfect. There isn't any dust or anything in it. Looks really good, um, and I'm really really happy with that color. Uh, maybe it'll show up again better like this. I'm not sure. That's a really nice color for the Enterprise. It's not, um, you know, bone white or whatever. It's uh, it's definitely got like a mineral looking white to it with just a little tiniest hint of that green in it. And um, so that's going to look great. I can't wait to see this all, you know, in its full six feet glory all painted up like this and everything. It's really going to be cool. And you guys are going to get to see it too. So that's a wrap for this one, you guys. Appreciate you checking it out. Um, I'll be back again real soon with another update on this. I'm going to uh, get back to the... Uh, Mobius Viper. I've also got a Mobius Battlestar I'm working on from the original series for a client of mine. Got a couple of uh, TOS 350s I'm working on. Going to start a couple of new models here pretty soon. Something I'm going to pick off the shelf. And look forward to the live show, guys. I'm going to put a introductory video up about that here maybe the next day or two. Announce it. Maybe ask a question. Uh, leave a comment about what time uh, or maybe what night of the week would be good for most people. Uh, like I said, I'm thinking Tuesday or maybe Saturday, uh, but it's definitely going to be 7 o'clock USA Central Time. That's the best time that works for me. So uh, we'll see you next time for the next update, everybody. Take care out there, and like always, happy modeling, everyone.